Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In this video, you're gonna hear directly from Chris and Cindy from the Honor Network and their journey, where it began and where it's leading. So stay tuned to the end. Welcome, Chris and Cindy from the Honor Network. Awesome. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Hey, listen, I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy schedule. Ladies and gentlemen, after you hear about this story, you're going to understand why I'm thanking them for taking so much time out of their busy schedules to meet with me and explain to you who they are and what they're all about, because it's pretty darn amazing here. Why don't we start at the beginning, Chris? How did this all... Let's just start at the very beginning. Where did all this start? Well, um, you know, to, to start from the very beginning, you know, we had, uh, I, I did a lot of philanthropic stuff throughout Texas. Um, I donated lots of resources and time. I had an internet company that did phenomenally well, that was uh, bought out by Travelocity after being in business for six months. So it gave me a lot of resources uh, as a young, uh, immature man doing some crazy stuff. I traveled all over the world, did some really, really, really fun stuff. Um, uh, doing more in the philanthropic area, I had a secretary uh, who was a widow of a Houston police officer. And uh, what I learned from her was something that will impact me for the rest of my life. And uh, here's a woman who was asking for time off on a regular basis because uh, I didn't know it, I had no idea, but Texas. Um, leads the nation year after year after year in number of police officers that are killed in the line of duty every single year except for 2001 so she was asking for time off on a con on a regular basis to go to funerals and I thought you know what to use your vacation time to go to funerals doesn't sound like a lot of fun um, so she said why don't you go with me and I went with her to a funeral and I was amazed at uh, seeing the amount of reverence and honor in people not just from Texas but literally from all over the world there to honor someone that they never knew never never played ball with didn't shake their hand didn't know who they were but not just from around the United States but from around the world honoring somebody who made the ultimate sacrifice for his community and um, you know going there seeing this uh, in the Texas heat, police officers wearing their uniforms uh, in hot, hot weather. Um, you know, I thought maybe I can do something, so I started bringing water. And uh, apparently that was a new idea there. No one was bringing water to these guys. And um, the water was gone within minutes. So the next time I went, I brought bigger coolers. Wasn't enough, that was gone same amount of time. So I said, you know what, I gotta beat these guys. If you're gonna be in Texas, do it big. So I actually got semi trucks that I got from the grocery stores with, with water, with ice, and it worked. So then the uh, Texas State Fair, um, I went to the fair once, I saw these trucks, these food trucks and things, that kind of a new concept back in that, that time. What, what time frame is this? Um, this was uh, back in uh, 2001, uh, early 2000s. Okay. Um, so, you know, 99, 2000, that, that time okay. frame. This, uh, so I would bring food trucks and restrooms and basically it's moving cities to go support these huge events that were going on uh, around Texas and around Louisiana and those areas. But this I, was all for fallen heroes. Fallen heroes. And really, I, I, I uh, got a reputation in Texas. Uh, I became uh, the Bobby Boucher of Texas. I was the water boy. Okay. And um, didn't realize that, but that's what they were calling me behind my back. Uh, and I was paying for all this myself. That's awesome. Um, so in uh, 2001, July 2001, a police officer from my hometown, I'm actually from Anchorage, Alaska. That's where I spent most of my childhood. And in Anchorage, Alaska, a police officer, Justin, was uh, headed to Eagle River, a suburb just outside of Anchorage, Alaska, 
Um, he's headed there to uh, assist another officer. He's got his lights, his sirens going on, and coming down the Glen Highway, uh, an individual sees him and deliberately crosses the highway and hits him head on. This is a man who didn't like police officers for some reason. Um, believe it or not, they are far away as Alaska too. There's a lot of people that don't like cops. But here's a man that wanted to take his life, take this officer's life, and two lives of the passengers that were in his car. So Justin was uh, raised in a town just south of Houston, Texas, where I was at, in Angleton, Texas. Um, the police chief, uh, who knew that I was in Texas, they heard about me being the water boy down there, and apparently they were making fun of me in Alaska as well. Um, I had still had family in Alaska. Uh, the chief contacted me and said, Chris, could you put us in touch with some of your cop friends down there, because we don't have contacts out there, but the family would like to bring Justin home to put him at rest. So uh, I've been one of those guys that kind of takes things too far, to the extreme. Um, you know, living in Texas, you have to live that kind of life. And um, so I actually had vehicles made up with all the Anchorage police graphics and logos. I got permission from the Anchorage Police Department to match Justin's car, scratch by scratch, number by number, exactly like his car. So when that plane landed, and this is pre 9-11, when the plane landed, I believe it was Northwest Airlines, they were still flying. Uh, I knew when the, where the family was sitting, and I had Texas State Troopers flanking the Anchorage Police vehicles. And I, the family looked outside the window, the airplanes got showered with, with water cannon salutes. Essentially, it was like a head of state was coming to, to Texas. And we took care of that family, took care of all the funeral expenses, cost, everything. And here we are in, in Texas, and just like funerals before, these folks didn't know who Justin was, didn't know anything about him. Uh, he lived in Angleton, Texas for a small part of his life, but lived in Alaska most of his adult life, was a police officer, gave his life, um, and people from around the world came to honor him. And uh, I thought that was pretty amazing. And uh, I received a call shortly after that from an organization that I had never heard of before called the Fraternal Order of Police, um, FOP. And these guys were just kind of shocked, confused as to why a civilian would be paying for that kind of stuff and to go to that extreme. But they were impressed with it and they just basically said, thank you, um, appreciate what you're doing. And I said, you know, it's the least I could do. Uh, here's a young man that gave his life and I gave some time, that's all I did. And um, so that was July 2001. And just like everybody, uh, you knew exactly, you remember now exactly what you were doing on September 11th, uh, 2001, where you were at, what was going on, uh, what channel you were watching, all that stuff. And I remembered uh, specifically watching the attack on our country. And after that second plane hit, knowing that our lives from that point on were gonna be different, not knowing what the next day was going to be. And uh, it was it was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. And um, you know, I went on just like anybody else. But I I received a call from the FOP again, shortly after the attacks, and they asked me to come to New York to help those families, like I did for Justin and his family. And I, without any hesitation, I thought absolutely that's the least I could do. Um, so I invited uh, some agencies around Texas. I had a brand new American Express credit card and I was ready to go do some traveling. Um, I uh, said, hey, if anybody wants to go, I'll cover your expenses. I had to put a stop to that pretty quick because within an hour I had 12 agencies that said we want to go. And that's a lot. I didn't have that much on my American Express card, but wanted to help these guys. So I took, um, rallied 12 agencies across Texas, met them at the, uh, uh, it was at the time the Texas Stadium where the Dallas Cowboys played. Uh, in Irving, Texas, met 12 agencies from all over Texas, came there. Um, just before leaving that area, I received a package, uh, unceremoniously, uh, from the Texas House of Representatives with a, just a handwritten note saying, thank you for sending our boys to New York. And uh, it was a Texas flag and an American flag. Didn't think anything about it, just put it in the vehicle and started heading east. Um, we met, uh, we drove a little bit north to Independence, Missouri, where we linked up with police officers from Seattle, uh, California, all over the West. We met there, 
Uh, by the time we got to New York, we had over 4,000 police uh, officers, firefighters from all over the nation. Um, I had a couple of guys from Anchorage, Alaska that were riding with me in, in the Anchorage police vehicle. Um, if you can imagine at that point, uh, trying to stop to use the restroom or to get fuel was a challenge. Um, oh, absolutely. We were on, there was helicopters following us everywhere we were going. Um, it was controlled chaos. It was like herding cats. You know, police officers are pretty well organized when it comes to doing, being a, getting all these guys from different agencies to do, you know, go to different places at the same time. And it was a real challenge. So um, we had schools and there's some archive footage that we found recently. Uh, I didn't even, you know, we, we saw, well, that's the school we went to. Um, stopping for lunch. Kids that say, hey, you know what? The principal would call us and say, bring your entourage over here to the school. The kids want to donate their lunch. Wow. So coming into those schools with all these police cars from around the country, fire trucks, ambulances, and eating lunch, um, using the restroom, doing what we got to do. But um, we had so many police vehicles and apparatus. Uh, we were still parking at um, one police plaza in New York City. Uh, well, we still had vehicles in New Jersey coming through the Holland Tunnel, uh, and it was just unbelievable. And again, men and women from all over the country and around the world to go honor people they never knew. And uh, I had this Texas flag and this American flag. We did several events in New York City, and um, you know, just like that secretary who was working for me in Houston, I was humbled. You know, I met some really amazing people, and. Um, I'll never forget, you know, being there at Ground Zero, it was still smoldering, it was still hot. And uh, I, I'm around some Texas officers and they have dust on their face. And, uh, you know, I just remember they're just speechless. And there was an engineer that approached us and he's got a respirator on, he's, you know, he's talking to us and takes the respirator off and just like he's giving us a tour of the subway or something. and. You could really feel for this man. Here he is. He's been working here day in, day out. He's here. And now he sees some people who have never seen anything like this. And he's got to give them the real quick elevator pitch of what's going on here. And as he starts to talk, he did it with such authority and such in a dignified manner that we were stunned. And the way he presented it, saying, you know, there are thousands of copiers desk, chairs, and just went through a whole list of different items. And then he would just throw other things in there. Humans, purses, suitcases, jet fuel, tires, all kinds of stuff that came down in an instant and all together vaporized and turned into this powdery dust and picks up this dust and blows on it. And he goes, you're breathing that right now. That's what's in the air. And these police officers, you get all the dust on their face, you see these clean little lines as they're crying. And uh, uh, he said that these people were vaporized in an instant. In an instant, just like that. And we were stunned, absolutely stunned. So we're doing some other events in New York and then we did the uh, a memorial service for the Port Authority. And we had this big dinner that was set up after the memorial service. And uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. We had police officers from, from all over the world there. And a little boy comes up to a police officer and sees that uh, he's got a patch on his shoulder, this police officer. And he goes, you know what? My daddy collect, collected patches, but he never had that patch. That is a neat patch. And that police officer didn't ask him if he wanted it. He just took that patch and ripped it off his shirt and gave it to that little boy. And it inspired the police officer next to him because other little boys wanted patches. There wasn't a police officer or firefighter that left that facility with a patch on their shoulder. And I thought that was pretty awesome. So, so it's uh, giving me chills now. Those of you out there, <laughs> uh, it's just amazing well, it, what people want to give back. It was, and, and at that point, they had a patch on their shoulder, you know, the shirt off their back, so to speak. And this little boy inspired this police officer just to do that. And, you know, I, I was taken back by that. And I thought, you know what, at the time, maybe, maybe it was selfish. I had a suit on, had a really nice tie on, and I wasn't going to cut my tie. I wasn't going to leave that behind. So I went and got that Texas flag and the American flag that was given to me. I was going to leave that behind for someone. 
And uh, I did, I left the flags there and this widow approaches me and reminded me of my secretary, just comes up to me as a matter of fact. And she tells me, I don't have my husband's wallet, boots, badge, helmet, hat, nothing. And she said what that engineer told us. My husband was vaporized. And she said, there are flags flying all over the country. And after 9-11, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing an American flag. Not just here in the United States, but there are other countries flying the American flag. Um, throughout the, the United States, they were sold out. You couldn't go to Lowe's, you couldn't go to Home Depot or Walmart to buy a flag. They were gone because everyone flew their flags. They put the flags on their cars, on their bumper stickers, on anything. There was a, a opportunity to put a flag, a, a lapel pin, or whatever. They were gone. The spirit of patriotism in our country at that point was so real, was so vibrant. It was the air we breathed. It didn't matter what color you were, what religion you were, what your ethnicity was, your male, female. It didn't matter. We were Americans. That was our gender. That was our neutrality was Americans. And she said that spirit of patriotism is going to disintegrate. It's going to vaporize. It's going to go away. So you need to keep your American flag so you don't forget what it's for. And I said, man, we can never forget. And um, so I kept the American flag. She kept the Texas flag. And I had no idea uh, what was going to happen at that point and really didn't think much about the flag other than doing something and uh, I drove from New York to Texas and um, you know on the way there you know it just was angry about what had happened and what I had seen the the smell the stench the taste and um, you know I got back to Texas and I went to uh, to enlist in the military and I was told uh, by a recruiter you are too fat and you're too old you can't do it he said uh, Come back in six weeks, we'll have another opportunity for you. So I went and I hired a physical trainer, I hired a nutritionist, and I hired someone to prepare meals for me. Um, they kicked my rear end, put me in shape. I went back there in six weeks, and the, drill, the recruiter, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. So I enlisted at 34 years old. Wow. And it was the most difficult, most challenging, gracious, best thing I'd ever done in my entire life. And I got to tell you, being 34 years old, waking up and being in formation at 6 o'clock in the morning with kids, 17, 18, 19 year old kids had never been away from mommy or daddy, um, running with these guys, the drill sergeants, being older than the drill sergeants, and them saying, if Heisler is passing you, you were wrong. You know, I, I was that benchmark. But I, uh, a lot of people didn't make the class. But I persevered. I, I went through it. It was it was a huge, em, enormous challenge for me, but I did it because I wanted to serve. And um, in the course of uh, uh, paying taxes, I was paying more in federal taxes than when I was earning. And you know I thought that was patriotic, but apparently that's a red flag in the military. So they uh, started scrutinizing my background and checking me out, and they knew that I had some uh, technical. Uh, skill sets and some different things that I was doing um, that you, you do what the Army wants you to do and I had the opportunity to go into the CID program and uh, had an opportunity to investigate espionage uh, crimes, computer crimes, hacks, um, worked with uh, some incredible agents around the nation on putting a child uh, uh, pedophiles away, uh, child molesters, uh, any felonious crimes on the military bases that's where our purview was. Um, so I really thought that was going to be it for me just to serve and get out and do my do my thing but um, the army wanted me to go to Iraq and I went to Iraq I was there 11 months 18 days while I was there we had uh, so you, you, you took the flag with you though, took right? the flag with me um, just with everything else you know people took their beef jerky their their uh, you know, whatever you needed to take, and I took my American flag. Didn't have a lot of space, but I took my American flag. Probably wasn't folded correctly, but I had it with me. But um, in those crazy opportunities when a soldier was, as far as I was concerned, silly enough to re-enlist while they're still in Iraq, uh, you had to have an American flag to have in the background for their picture. Um, 
when a soldier is getting promoted, get the American flag, heist or go get your flag. Uh, we had soldiers that were being killed before we'd send them home. We'd do a memorial service, heist or go get your flag. So we started building up some momentum there. And uh, first sergeant, it was first sergeant Scott Denson at the time, he's now retired command sergeant major. He told me to go get that American flag because it had been used so many different times. And at this point, the flag is folded nicely, and I'm walking uh, somewhere, and, and there's a couple of soldiers that are sitting on the ground, and uh, the first sergeant mentioned a couple of explicitives, telling him that is a special American flag. You need to stand up when that's coming through. That is a, that is a flag of honor. And ever since then, we started using that flag specifically for different things, and um, uh, it was just kind of organically happened. Um, I got injured in Iraq after doing uh, a couple of, uh, or several years of physical therapy and rehab. Um, I had an opportunity to fly the flag over the state capitol in Texas on September 11th, 2007. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a rainy, rainy, miserable day where we got the flag on the flagpole. It was on the news. It was well covered. And uh, in Texas, they have a uh, uh, Texas cable news network goes all over the state. Um, there were some officers in Midland, Texas that saw it and they um, they had lost three police officers that were shot and killed. And up until uh, that period of time, 2007, October was a horrible month for law enforcement and a number of officers being killed. And unfortunately, this point in time, having three officers that were ambushed uh, made a lot of news. So uh, these guys were saying, hey, we, we'd like that, that fly to come to honor these three police officers and had never done that before, uh, didn't know how I was going to do it. And I said, I can't physically go. Uh, I was actually in Austin, Texas at the time. They said, well, there's a pilot that's based here in Odessa, Texas. He's in Austin now. If you meet him at the airport, he'll bring us the flag tomorrow. He's going to be flying the airplane. It was a commercial airplane. Um, Took the flag to him at six o'clock in the morning, and he 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 didn't know. I had no idea. But when he landed, here are these police officers from all over the nation, around the world, to honor three men they never knew, never met. Police vehicles from all over the country lined up along the runway to meet that flight with this American flag on it. They sprayed the plane down with the with the fire trucks. There were a group of uh, honor guards inside the airport that met that flight, met the pilot, took the flag, and honored those three police officers with that flag. And I'm in Austin, Texas. I have no idea what's going on. And shortly after, I started getting calls. I got a call from Bobby Parker in uh, Miami-Dade, Florida, saying, hey, we'd like to get that flag for Jose Samoana, who was killed here in Miami, Florida. Well, what are you talking about? Well, we just saw on the news about those guys in Midland, Texas. We want that special flag for our police officer. And uh, he put me in touch with another police officer, Alvaro Zabalet. And um, he said, we're going to get that flag here, but we have to send it to Broward County, Florida, because Sergeant Chris Rica was killed on a Walgreens parking lot. I'm just sitting there doing his report, and some guy comes up and ambushes him. So ever since then, that flag, that one single American flag has been moving non-stop all over the nation. Um, thousands of police officers, firefighters, soldiers have been honored with this one flag. It was on the very last space shuttle on the International Space Station. It's logged over seven million miles. We, we got to, we have to stop saying seven million miles, we got to just say millions and millions of miles because it's just been going and going and going. So, uh, we realized uh, very, very quickly that this was much bigger than Chris. Um, so we created the Honor Network um, to keep the continuity of the flag going on. Uh, so long after I am not here and Cindy's not here, the flag will be managed and, and taken care of by the Honor Network. So now explain, so what, what do they do with the flag at these ceremonies? So typically the flag will come in and uh, rest on the right side of the fallen hero. The head side of the casket stays folded, sits on a tabletop uh, easel. Um, sometimes uh, that's, that's the most common way. Sometimes we will do a special event. Uh, we do a special memorial ceremony. Um, it will sometimes fly on a flagpole or be on display for a period of time. Sometimes an hour for every year of service for the officer or the firefighter or soldier. 
uh, but the most common is to have it at the funerals. Um, but logistics are always being dictated to us by circumstance, right? Sure. Um, and those circumstances can be funding, logistics, weather, um, how can we physically get there? Um, so sometimes we can't get to the funeral on time. Right. So we'll come afterwards or we'll, we'll do everything we can to make it work. Um, but it really is, it's the, it's the circumstance and logistics. How do we get there? How can we make this happen? Um, you know, there was a period of time where we were flying uh, all over the country um, and uh, circumstances with uh, one of the airlines that we were working with uh, went bankrupt and uh, when they merged with another airline, uh, they weren't so cooperative and were not absolutely law enforcement friendly. Um, we have a new relationship now with United Airlines. They've been phenomenal to work with. So uh, Cindy and I, after 2017, uh, we decided we couldn't spend you know what we were on hotel cost well before we get there hold on here i think we have to go back a little bit don't we because you know cindy has met with you this whole time now why, why don't we go ahead and talk about how it is that you two came yeah. about it's all you babe i'm gonna have a beverage <laughs> you take your drink break you're still, on camera. You're still so on camera. traveling around the country i was uh, we actually had um i had pickup trucks i was using okay. Um, between those two trucks, about a half million miles of driving okay. around the country. Um, I was in uh, Seaside, Oregon, and coming through Colorado to honor uh, Deputy Derek Gear with the Mesa County Sheriff's Department in uh, Colorado. These names stick with you. Absolutely. So, as we are uh, being escorted through the state of Utah, um, I had, uh, when we get to one state line, we meet with other law enforcement. And since this was the host state and the host agency, they're actually that Mesa County's right on the state line as well. Um, we stopped there to transfer from one agency to the next. And just so happens, Cindy was a member of the Honor Guard team for uh, the agency in that area. They had a, a team with the Grand Junction Police Department. And, um, you know, it's, I say it affectionately that uh, she started stalking me afterwards. We did the, we, we, we obviously our, our main mission was to honor Deputy Gear, but um, she fell in love with the story with the amount of uh, attention to detail and the things that we, that we do and how we do it and the reverence, and that's right up her alley. So um, what, what year was this? 2016. Okay. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> so, um, it was just that uh, we, we are so much alike in tune with things. Um, uh, she just got it. There's a couple of, there's, I, I, I say this affectionately, there's two kinds of people that get the flag. Um, the kind of person that will be at a baseball game uh, when the national anthem is being played, they're either going to salute, put their hand over their heart, take and their hat off, take their hat off um, or the other person is gonna be the person that's not going to take their hat off, sit down, take a text, Make a phone call or kneel. So, Cindy, why don't you tell us your side of the story? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Derek Gear, the big gear, was killed uh, in February of 2016. And I was actually on light duty at the time because I was recovering from shoulder surgery. And so I was up in investigations, heard the radio call. Um, very, very difficult to hear that radio call of a brother um, down, you know, that, that needs help. and not be able to respond to that so that was that was probably one of the worst days in my law enforcement career um after the fact you know as honor guards we train and train and train for that day because you can only do things right you can only honor your brother or sister right one time you know there's a thousand ways to screw it up but you can only do it right once and so being with Grand Junction Police Department, Mesa County, or Grand Junction is inside Mesa County, and it takes an entire team because there's so much to do when when we lose a brother or sister in the line of duty, a lot of logistics, and so everybody's involved. So even being on light duty, I was kind of known as the honor guard mom with their honor guard, mm -hmm. and so our honor guard sergeant uh, came and said, "Hey, I need you to round up everybody. We need help." And so we just we went to work. We do what we've been training for, and I had heard about the U.S. Honor Flag through um, the Colorado Professional Firefighters Foundation. They put on, and a lot of our team attended 
that academy back in 2012. And so they had a mock U.S. honor flag that we used and we learned about the history and whatnot. But it, actually when Chris came to town to honor Derek, that was the first, my first physical interaction with the flag. And so that was a true honor, you know, of, of hearing about this. And fortunately, up until we lost Derek, not needing it um, for anybody in our department, you know, but but the same having that re having that honor for Derek was was quite an honor for our agency and for um, the entire community. And so I was actually assigned to Chris and his detail, you know, didn't really know what that entailed, got his cell phone number and I said, what do you need? And so we met him at the state line, escorted him into town um, to the funeral home where Derek was at and the flag was placed with Derek and stayed with Derek the entire time until internment. And so just, you know, I was kind of Chris's sidekick and needed to stay with him and learn even more history about the flag more in depth because um, what we learned in the academy was pretty basic. You know, but really got the in-depth, full detail and full story of the flag. And being part of the Honor Guard, you know, that was just who I am. It was all about honoring our, our brothers and sisters, and that's a passion of mine. And so after my interaction with the U.S. Honor Flag, um, I pretty much decided that day that I want to do what you do. You know, and I, I shared that with Chris. And after Chris left town, I, I called him and I said, you know, I've donated, but I want to do more. This is this isn't about me. Eh? This is much bigger than than any of us. But this is I want to honor my brothers and sisters. And at that point, I had had about 18 years in, in law enforcement, and so I was looking towards, you know, my retirement. And so um, Chris said that he was taking volunteers, and so I got on board as a volunteer and was basically pulling double duty. You know, my law enforcement okay. um, job with Grand Junction PD and. And work in logistics, kind of behind the scenes for the owner network, and then September 12th of 2017, I um, decided to uh, go ahead and initiate my retirement and went full-time volunteering with Chris. Well, that's so, awesome. Yeah. You know, something, I, I, you know, I'm just thinking of just hearing her say that, uh, first of all, she is an incredible human being to have that kind of passion. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet officers like Cindy. Um, all over the nation who have approached me and said the same so, yeah, this is I love what you do I want to do this um, but that's a phone call and they go away right um, Cindy has been a unique a unique person um, and being able to stick stick through it you know she, didn't, wanted, go away. she didn't go away she, <laughs> she was staying staying there so you know I'll tell you a quick story um, there was a police officer um, long before uh, that had interaction with the honor flag, just like Cindy's talking about now, that fell in love with the story, wanted, was nearing his retirement, wanted to be part of what we do, um, wanted to retire and honor heroes, his brothers and sisters. He actually held the honor flag at a funeral for two police officers that were gunned down in Topeka, Kansas in 2012. He was a member of the honor guard, just like Cindy was, and uh, honored those two police officers and then in uh, 2014, here he was doing a traffic stop and gets ambushed, shot and killed. So what City's doing is what Jason wanted to do, Jason Harwood. And in honor of his sacrifice, uh, of course, you know, Jason was a, a person who had that incredible passion. If you take uh, Jace, Jason and Cindy and mix them together, um, I mean, you'd have a super cop, I mean, be RoboCop, but uh, here's a guy that just got it. He got it, he wanted it, he needed it, and that was something he was going to do, and he was on that directory to do it, and that was taken away from him by a 19-year-old kid. And uh, uh, when I spoke at his funeral, I learned that he was the actual first police officer in the nation that actually held the honor flag previously and later honored with that exact same flag. And in his honor and his sacrifice, um, we, whenever the flag is inside the special case, we call the case Harwood One after that police officer. And I, I, I say that because I live with Cindy, I know Cindy, I know her passion and that drive that, uh, that it's like so many awesome, awesome police officers all over the country. And when it comes to an honor guard, it's precision, it's detail, it's, it's, it's ethics, it's integrity, it's transparency, it's uh, you're the tip of the spear. 
And I am so, so lucky to have Cindy uh, to make that call and to keep making those calls and to stick with me. And uh, she's been by far the best thing that's ever happened to not just the honor flag, but to me as well. Um, she's been a, my hero and she's done some incredible things and uh, we've had a unique journey this, this way and if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Deputy Gear and people like Jason Harwood, um, I don't think there would be a Cindy Heisler. So thank you. So when did y'all tie the knot here? Uh, January uh, 11, 2018. <laughs> Two okay. tests See? and you passed both. See? Nice. <laughs> I got don't ask him what my it. birthday is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have yeah. yeah. It's not on your cheat sheet. No, it's awesome. So now, so now, so then, so you're putting miles on these trucks, and it was getting to be too much, I guess, truck wise, too expensive for you guys to be staying in hotels. So then you made the decision to do what? You were giving, you gave 80% of what you owned away? I had to say about 90%. Oh, I have much more than 80%. We gave a lot of stuff away. I just, I make him purge every year. So in okay. fact, we just had another purge about a month ago. So <laughs> if we get something new inside the coach, something has to go. So if it's a new shirt, his shirt's gotta go. There we go. So, yeah. so then so then you decided to do what? Well, um, we, so there's some, some logistics in this decision. I had a lot of medical stuff going on, a lot of health stuff, uh, fighting Crohn's disease, very, very aggressive Crohn's disease, you know, constantly eating out at different restaurants, uh, being on the road, different hotels, different kitchens, different bathrooms, different environment, different settings. There was no continuity uh, for us. So we had to make a change uh, and we decided to go in an RV. And we, uh, uh, but we spent a lot of time researching, you know, investigating, finding out what's, what's the best, not, not just where, uh, what to buy, but where to buy it. Um, you know, I think that's important. We, we, we did that due diligence. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have bought anything we wanted. We could have spent a lot of money on something that we, we probably more than what we needed, but um, we looked at uh, diesel pushers. We looked at, uh, you know, Tobles, we looked at all kinds of stuff. But um, you, you said you settled for one particular one. We didn't yeah. settle. I don't think we well, settled. Well, I, would say, I would say we made a lifestyle choice and we went with a, a Grand Design Momentum Coach because it had everything that we wanted and we needed and we could modify our lifestyle cohesively together. Yeah, my point there was you didn't you didn't just go with anything. Oh no, no you, not at all. You well, your... and it's ironic because the first coach, the first um, fifth wheel that we ever walked in was actually a Grand Design Momentum, okay. and that was the last one we ever walked in. So now we are uh, and, and we're what, Grand Design for life. What happened was so we we were in. Um, uh, I'm not sure where we went through. We saw Grand Design. We fell in love with it, but we we knew we had a lot of work to do. Look at other ones, but. It's like going to a really good restaurant and having awesome fajitas at Papacitos in Texas. Mm -hmm. It ruins your fajita experience anywhere else you're going to go because you're always going to compare it to those really good fajitas. But so now the big thing though with this is that, that you actually, this is something you, the, the Honor Network doesn't own this. You Absolutely. guys actually paid for yeah. this out of pocket. We paid cash out of pocket for the, the coach. Network. We didn't finance anything. We had to do this. We, we bit the bullet. We got it. Um, the Honor Network had... Uh, doesn't own this equipment. This is our home. We live there. Uh, we work in the back, live in the front. Um, it uh, it's still a sacrifice for us, you know. Like Cindy said, if I get a if I get a shirt, a t-shirt, a sock, uh, uh, anything, one goes in, one goes out. But so there's a me smarter there's a smarter way to do things. You know right. what I mean? When sure. when we owned a house, we were never there. And so why pay mortgage and bills somewhere that, that you aren't? And so there was just a better way to do it. And so that's when we made the transition back October 30th, um, 2017. So we're coming up on two years of being on the road full time. So ladies and gentlemen, you, you heard something here. Do not donate anything to them because they're going to have to purge something if you, <laughs> yeah. if you, if you, do, if you donate something. 
<laughs> unless, it's, unless it's fuel. We love diesel. No, yeah, well, I meant clothing and things of that nature, you know. Umbrellas, coats, socks, whatever. Do not donate any of that stuff to them because they're going to have to purge something. But, but I will tell you that when we get shirts of fire departments, police departments, different events and stuff, when it, when it is time to purge and we get new stuff, we actually, I actually cut the shirt. So I cut the logos out of the shirt and there's a method behind my madness on that of one day we're going to make a quilt w with all the... Oh, T-shirts. That is yeah. awesome. So yeah. that way we're we're, so. pur we're purging. <laughs> we're purging, but we're but we're saving that stuff. Well, hold on here. I think he asked he asked you a question. Do you <laughs> I didn't sew? hear you. What's that? Do, 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 do you sew? <laughs> yeah, I asked him. Yes, I yes I can. Uh, okay. Really? <laughs> yes. Like not, not, not a frequent hobby of mine, but yes, I can. Okay. There's a lot of things that I can do. But you know, you can always YouTube it. Yes, that's true. <laughs> By the way, folks, Absolutely. speaking of YouTube, make sure that you do check out, and I'm going to have the link down below, do check out their uh, YouTube channel. Um, they've made some great strides. Uh, they, they're going to be going places, and I'm asking everyone out there to share this video and become a part of the Honor Network. And all that information is going to be down below. But back on to you guys, because this is about, well, it's really not... I think you guys have it dialed in, and you understand that it really isn't about you. It's not about us. It's at all. never been about us, and that, that's it's why it's about the, the heroes that exactly that pay the service and sacrifice every single day that walk out the door and leave their families not knowing if they're coming home. And that's who that's what the honor flag stands for is that service and that sacrifice, and that's what the organization and everything stands for. That's who we honor. You know, it's not it's not about us at all, and it never has been, and it never will be. It's about America's heroes. Yeah. So now, so now, so 2017, you went ahead and you 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 got a, a, a grand design, a 2018 grand design momentum. So when Cindy says that you know we've been doing this for two years, now I want to clarify, <laughs> this isn't two years with you know two months here, three months there. These are two years of wheels turning. We have gone through how many tires? We're on our third set. Third set on a triple axle vehicle. Um, and we change them frequently just because of safety is a really important thing. Uh, we, we drive slow. We, we're not in that fast lane very often. Uh, we keep our speed limit on. We, we stay, I think, our max about 73 miles per hour. 70. 73 miles, 70, yes. 70 miles per hour, um, even on the uh, 80 mile hour speed limits in Texas or wherever. We maintain that speed just, we can go faster, but we don't. Because that's our life behind us, and that's a lot, a lot of weight going down the road. Absolutely. Um, well, those tires are rated at 75 miles per hour, 75 miles per hour, and that's for a reason because you're hauling a lot of weight. And right. every every vehicle out there, and you know, as we refer to in the law enforcement, you have a weapon that you're in charge of. Yeah. And yep. you have to be responsible for that. And it's not just, you know, you can only control what you can't control, but you got to be aware of everybody else around you who might not be paying attention. And there's a lot of areas that we travel to that aren't used to seeing big rigs. And, you know, they don't know how to, you know, how to act, if, if you will, on the road. Absolutely. And yeah. so, so that's our responsibility to make sure that, that we're keeping an eye out for ourselves. Now, and we see a lot of people out there that are driving at, you know, re oh, way faster than they need to be pulling anything mm -hmm. uh, or not pulling anything. And it's a... Uh, that is, that's really, really dangerous. So safety is paramount to us. And it's a lot of times, you know, um, and, you know, the, the number one killer of firefighters is cardiac arrest. The second biggest killer of firefighters are traffic accidents. The second biggest killer of police officers are single vehicle traffic accidents. So how ironic would that be if we hurt somebody or get killed on a way to a funeral for a fallen hero that was killed in a traffic incident. So safety is, is really important to us. And, we encourage other folks to do that, and, and um, we're not perfect at all. Sure. But the axles, you know, the braking systems, um, we check the tires, the air pressure, all that stuff is critical stuff if you're going to be doing it. So. so now, so at what point in time did you set up your 501C? So the Honor Network, uh, in 2008, we created the Honor Network, and the reason we did that is that uh, we wanted that flag, the Honor flag, to continue you know, long after I'm gone. And uh, we had some assistance in getting that created. We had to think it out. Uh, we actually worked initially with the FBI and the Arts and Antiquities Unit because uh, they're the ones that told us, hey, you've got something special here, and that flag is going to be challenged. Someone's not going to believe it is the 
same flag that's doing all this stuff. And we have been challenged and um, once by a, a media reporter, but he had no idea. Uh, so we let the cat out of the bag after the news story came out. Um, he was trying to challenge the authenticity, but he didn't realize that the flag has six microchips sewn in the seam of the flag. Uh, each ship has its own scanner. The scanners are never at the same place, place at the same time. Every time that flag moves around from one place to another, uh, if it's outside our command and control, we scan the flag to make sure it's the real flag. Um, and there are several agencies involved with that. Um, so when that story came out, we, we immediately met people know that, hey, it is in fact the same flag. And all the agencies that have had the flag and scanned the flag, they know it's the same flag. Um, so. The Internet was created to protect the flag, and it's done a great job in doing so. And it's been unfortunate we've had to use uh, some protections in place and uh, um, some avenues with litigation with people that have wanted the flag destroyed, uh, protesters, um, different silly things like that. Um, and Cindy and I are not immune from that individually as well. We've had uh, vehicles vandalized. Uh, the previous, uh, the first Honor One vehicle was shot at once um, we've had uh, just you know silly things like that that go on um, so no, no matter the more good you do and the more people you're exposed to there's going to be that one percent that's out there it's going to catch up to you every now and then right so what else do you do besides uh, funerals well there's a lot you know our mission is to honor educate and inspire and that involves you know a lot of other activities from uh, parades we've been to symphonies um, we've had uh, uh, four Super Bowls 16 World Series baseball games we've been to uh, sporting events we've been to all the military academies from West Point Annapolis the Air Force Academy and one of our favorites is to go to the schools the elementary schools the uh, middle schools the high schools and we have the opportunity, that flag is a master key that opens lots and lots of doors. And we use that key very carefully uh, uh, to go to the right places, to give the right message. Um, it's not about religion, it's not about politics, it's not about uh, what's going on in the news, it's about patriotism and what uh, uh, the American pride, um, loyalty, honor, integrity. Uh, we talk to them about what what makes a hero, and you know, in my life experience of business and and the military and law enforcement, uh, integrity has been the fuel that drives success in anything anybody does. Um, and if we can go there and talk to kids about integrity and about honor and what those things are, um, we impact a lot of really really great Americans. And part of that message, when we go to the schools, we talk to them, you know, it's not just a firefighter, a police officer, it's not Spider-Man, it's not Superman, it's not a professional wrestler, it's not a football player, but it's, you know, people like teachers and nurses and coaches, doctors, uh, the unsung heroes, you know, the dispatchers, um, the people that are behind the scenes making things work. And none of those things work without integrity and, and all shapes and sizes, you know, small and large you know from uh you know the the truck driver that's driving across the country you know late at night to bring you know food to the market uh to the farmers that are doing things hard at work you know all those little things it all takes people of integrity to make these wheels turn that makes this country such an incredible vibrant place to live and they just get it and it's pretty awesome to be able to see young boys who uh who are not used to getting that kind of message, um, who aren't used to seeing videos and seeing uh, a piece of American history right there in front of them that uh, I guess the best way to equate it to is, uh, you know, some people when they go to church, they have faith and they have hope and we all do and something we can't see. We have to believe in it. But here's something in front of them that represents all the goodness and all the greatness of our country and it's physically right there and to that one kid that we picked that actually gets to hold it um, making 14 year old boys cry is awesome uh, and impactful it is it's very impactful um, just like it's a career moment for any firefighter or police officer or soldier that holds the honor flag um, 
you know, whether they're a, a rookie or a senior officer or a firefighter, uh, it's, it's, you know, Cindy and I haven't gotten desensitized to what it means to these folks because we see them tremble and shake just with emotions um, and with pride. And um, we get to see that exact same response in little boys and little girls. That's awesome. Everyone in between, the exact same response. And one of the fascinating things we talk about, um, we have the same message, it's about 45 minutes long. We have to adjust the delivery depending on who the audience is. It's interactive, we make them laugh, They're in, they respond with us. But at the end, when it comes to questions and answers, uh, if we're talking to someone at Harvard, or we're talking to somebody at West Point, or someone at Eastside Elementary School, they're going to ask the exact same questions. Well, and it's awesome. It's, uh, it's and we've had principals and, and teachers tell us so many times that, well, you've been able to keep the, captivate these kids for 45 minutes, and that's really difficult to do. And to us, it's just a, another day of, of our mission. That's to honor, educate, and inspire. And, and we're getting pretty good at it. That's awesome. I'm just pausing for a moment here. So now, the other, you had said something when we were talking, and I, so I want to ask you about this, but I thought you said something about you have some type of a network with like 3,000 different funeral homes yeah. or whatever. So let me ask you that question. Okay. So besides, you know, the educating, besides attending funerals, there's something else that's pretty impressive and uh, I think it, it speaks volumes to your dedication and what you guys are bringing to these fallen families. And the, it had to deal with some relationships you had with different uh, funeral homes and so Well, forth. it's, you know, there's a part of the reason that we came up with the name The Honor Network is because it's a collection of individuals um, who get it, who understand. Um, it's companies like uh, Wine Guard or uh, Network Solutions or um, Whelan, people that support what we're trying to do and get us where we need to go. And sometimes it's been automobile manufacturers, sometimes it's been airlines, um, but the one that has really stuck through all of that, um, that provides a direct benefit uh, within our organization that we help pilot uh, and get the message out with an organization out of Houston, Texas, Service Corporation International. And what they're able to do is just remarkable. And they have a collection of nearly 3,000 funeral homes and crematories all over the nation, actually throughout North America. And with that partnership, we're able to um, facilitate funerals at no cost, meaning that really at the end of everything, it's just a death certificate that's required. And typically that ranges anywhere from $5 to $20 around the country. Um, so what that enables us to do is to provide those services at no cost. So any of the police departments, associations, unions, or uh, different uh, organizations that even local philanthropists that want to provide those services at no cost, uh, we encourage them to provide those funds directly to the families uh, for educational purposes or for whatever the family needs are. And that's uh, through their public servant program. Right, right. So it, it just works. Um, so having the Honor Network in place is a, and that name is a, is a, a cornerstone for what we're able to do because we, we interact with so many great people. And it's a network of honor. Uh, the Honor Network is not just Chris and Cindy, it's just not uh, our board of directors, but it's a group of people who just get it and they're going to do whatever it takes to allow us to honor, educate, and inspire. Well, so that, and that comes back to one other thing that when we ch chatted um, prior to meeting here that you brought up. How much are your board of directors paid? You know, it's interesting. Um, our board of directors uh, since inception, when we started this, have gotten paid absolutely nothing. Um, there's not any compensated staff members uh, of, and our, of our board. Uh, that's not to say that uh, at some point in the future, um, if we have the ability to have staff to do things, it, it, it's shocking to think that we've been able to accomplish what we've been able to accomplish with no paid staff. Um, and there won't ever be a time where I'm compensated or, or Cindy's compensated, um, but if we have support staff logistics that are working behind the scenes, 
man, the whole world is ready for us to take on and to do so many more things. We just haven't been to a point to where we could ever afford that. Right. Um, so to answer your question is nothing. Well, and that, our, that our was core members are not getting paid. That's where I wanted to go with this 501c3c. 501c3. C3. See, I always get these numbers on there. But it's a nonprofit organization. That's why I wanted to bring bring light to that because there are so many quote nonprofits out there that pay the CEO or board of directors or whatever ungodly amounts of money, and it's a very small pittance of the money that is collected and donated to those charities that actually get out to the end user. And that's what I was just trying to bring. bring yeah, you know, and that's, um, and we provide, you know, any, our financials are, you know, transparency is our fuel and integrity. So um, our financials are very transparent. Uh, if you look at some charities, and I, and I won't mention them by name, but like you said, there are other uh, charities that don't do anything similar to what we do, but they have the same genre. Uh, police officers, firefighters, um, where some of their their board is making six-figure incomes, um, and they're not really doing a lot. And yeah. I can safely say that um, out of the events that we've been to, where we've honored a fallen hero, I haven't seen any of them there. Um, so I'm not really sure what it is that they're providing, um, besides a you know a decent salary. I'm sure it's a great thing that they're doing, but at the end of the day, um, we have something that's a an immediate. ROI for the actual donor. Mm -hmm. They can get a return on their investment seeing what is happening with those dollars. And that's wheels moving and a hero's well, you're, you're, you're out there, you're visual. I mean, you're out there in person, you know. You're yeah. providing something where people can actually see what you're providing, and I think that's a major difference. Well, we talked about the experience. You know, you have to experience the flight. We run into a lot of people um, daily that say, I've never heard about this. I had no idea that this existed. Well, that's part of our educational piece of our mission and a lot of agencies a lot of people don't hear about the organization or hear about the u.s honor flag until there's a tragedy right you know and that's the first time that they hear about it but going back to your board question about how they get paid um they don't get free gear they have to buy their t-shirts they have to buy their challenge coins chris and i when we're wearing u.s honor flag gear chris and cindy buy that and pay the honor network for that gear so not us, not our board members, nobody gets any free... There's no free lunch. Nope, there is no and, free and lunch at all. And it's not, um, and that's just because where we're at right now, we can't afford to do that. Sure. And not to say that if there's a point where I would love to be able to give our board members hats and shirts because they're going to promote the story and get that out. Um, it's just not there. Okay. Um, so, you know, and when it comes to, and our board is consists of full-time uh, police officers, firefighters. So they're doing their full-time job already. Um, so their interaction with us on a, on a you know quarterly or on a point by point basis. Well, I'll give you an example. We have one of our board members who's a uh, uh, a commander, a command staff level trooper in Florida. So he works with the honor guard and he's handled the honor flag several times in the course of just you know fallen heroes in that state. Uh, for both police and fire. He's worked with us across the country. Uh, we have a board member in Milwaukee um, who's a full-time firefighter. He also runs another charity, uh, another or nonprofit organization, and he's a board member. Um, so these are people with hearts of passion. We have um, uh, another board member that's in California who is a, a full-time uh, sheriff deputy. And you know, at the same time, she's got some things going on and She's at home, on her free time, she's taking care of her grandparents, a 94-year-old and 102-year-old wow. grandparents. So, life of service, passion. Um, we have another board member who is an incredible uh, IT technologist. Uh, she's a doctorate. She teaches people on educational things and um, incredibly smart, smart lady. And she does our, our secretarial stuff for the Honor Network and keeps us... Uh, in line with documents that have to be filed, takes our notes for us, right. and we need that because if you we can't get firefighters and cops to do that, it would be really bad. Right. Um, but you know, then we have you know attorneys and things like that that have their full time jobs and lives going on, and you know, and uh, they're not getting paid from the honor network, but they're putting into it just like you know, oh, yes. the, these are people with with hearts of passion and service, um, and you, their return on that is because they know what we're doing. They understand the passion, what's going on. They understand our financials. They understand the struggles, the difficulties, the challenges. 
Um, but they're, they're, they're there with us and they give us guidance when we need it, uh, give us clarity when we need it, and uh, for the attorneys, provide the litigation when we need it. There you go. Well, and this is your, so this is your full-time job zone? This is our full-time life. It's a lifestyle. Right. Well, um, and I wouldn't say job. Well, when you do what you love, it's not working, right? It's not working. Right. Yeah, yeah police officers, yeah. teachers, and, and uh, soldiers, firefighters, don't do it for the pay. They, they, it's, a, it's, it's their lives. Right. One more thing, just going back real quick. When you when you were asking about the funeral service and the public servant program, you mentioned Service Corporation International. That that's not really a name that that agencies are going to recognize. It's the Dignity Funeral Home. Right. Um, the S service Corporation International is that umbrella organization, and they have the Dignity Funeral Homes. Right. The Dignity Fur Funeral Homes are the ones that have the public servant program that yeah. provides that service um, for the fallen heroes. Yeah, they so have. I just wanted to mention Dignity because a lot of people aren't going to recognize Service Corporation yeah. International if they Google it and looking for an SCI funeral home. And SCI right. is the is a publicly traded company, and they have uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Neptune Society. They have Dignity Memorial, uh, Dignity Funeral Homes. They have cremation services. Um, I think they have ownerships in several different other operations, caskets, and uh, different monuments and memorials. Very, very large, powerful, influenceable funeral home. It's the largest in the world. Um, and having the partnership that we have with them uh, is tremendous. Uh, and so we've, I think the number was, I think $12 million uh, in services that we've wow. been able to partner with them and providing uh, for their folks. Um, we have a dislike and distaste and a foul uh, smell when it comes to anyone making a profit off of a fallen hero's sacrifice. Um, and I'll have to say, uh, we also work with funeral home small mom and pop agencies like uh, Getz Funeral Home in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. They're not a dignity uh, funeral home. They're not part of Service Corporation International, but they, like lots of other funeral homes, know it's not appropriate to do you know the, the undignified thing and, and charge people for things like that. And here's a guy and his family, they provide funerals at no cost. And we've had the opportunity to work with him directly uh, with several situations in New Mexico, uh, in uh, the southern New Mexico. And he's provided those same services at no cost. Awesome. Uh, we've worked with, because of our 501c3 status, we're able to interact with funeral homes and counsel them and give them some guidance. and. It's the right thing to do. We have a great deal of PR and media attention that we can bring and, and bring some uh, recognition to those folks and give them the opportunity to provide those at an in-kind donation and the honor network can give them the, the tax benefit for that. Uh, so for some of those small business owners, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, and they get it, they understand. Um, and you know, funeral homes, they, they deal Obviously with tragedy, that's their business, that's what they do, um, but not a lot of funeral homes have experience working with fallen police officers and firefighters. Uh, and when it comes to a service for a fallen hero, um, the interaction with the funeral home is uh, a lot different than it would be for anybody else, because first of all, we can't use their, for their, their property's not big enough. We have to use arenas and you know, large uh, venues and things like that, convention centers or very, very large churches, the largest church in the area. Um, so uh, they, they get that, you know, as far as getting vehicles and transportation, we have motorcades and all those things taken care of. So we make it a lot easier for them too. That's uh, awesome. That's great. So, yeah, so it's not just, you know, Dignity and Service Corporation International, but it's people like Chad Getz and, and other uh, funeral homes just like him all over the country that uh, we're able to work with. Um, but it's because of organizations like the big companies that are doing, the, doing that. Uh, that it, it's pretty motivational for other ones to follow suit with them. Great. So now as far as from expenses so far, I mean I know when you first started doing this it was all out of your pocket. Yes sir. And now you're starting to get some support through the Honor Network, your 501c? So the 501c3 is we're, we're, we're getting to the point where the Honor Network is self-sustaining, um, keeps itself afloat. Um, but being able to, or getting to that point has been a struggle uh, and has been expensive. Um, uh, individually, Cindy and I, we still, you know, we put a lot of sweat and tears and, and, and blood into this, but it, it is what it is. Uh, we're still gonna keep doing what we're doing, but we had, to, we had to back away after last year, we had to say, okay, 
we have the coach so we eliminated so many expenses or reduced them but there are still costs associated with that so what's the best way to calculate these costs and we came up with a reasonable number it's a dollar a mile um, it's a lot you know a lot less than if you're moving uh, anything else across the country whether it be a flag or a, a car um, but that dollar is everything uh, it's the maintenance it's the insurance it's the fuel it's the the lodging the meals everything is included in that one dollar so for every mile we move it's a dollar not not Chris and Cindy's dollar but the honor network is, is that's the goal we want to make sure that we can keep that going on but to expand on that a little bit Chris and Cindy still pay for the maintenance, they still pay for the insurance. The Honor Network is not in a position to cover those expenses yet. That is our goal um, and obviously our vision to be able to have those expenses covered um, because we're obviously using the coach. We're not using the coach to go on vacation, we're using it for um, U.S. Army flag missions um, and events. So Chris and Cindy are still covering the, the hefty insurance bill. So. It's, uh... It's it, you know we we live off my pension so we we don't have any you know uh, royalties anymore from the internet sales all that stuff has been you know long gone and um, we're we're comfortable um, but we're we're also smart we're not going to put ourselves in a hole um, you know we just can't do that we have grandchildren we want to spoil and mm -hmm. things that we want to be able to do uh, but our primary mission is to to honor heroes with this. With this mission well i could see that and then you know talking with you, you know we spoke a little bit earlier before we actually decided to sit down and do this and it amazes me how much time um, and resources you have given up of yourself both of you uh, it amazes me and for the length of time that you've been doing it chris so i mean what i'm asking everybody out there watching here this is take the time take a look at the links below and donate even if it's just a dollar but give something, give something back. There are many, many heroes out there that are giving their lives, they're giving the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and this is something that needs to go on. And it's, uh, I think it's a, an awesome job that you all are doing. And we have one other thing we're gonna go ahead and cover and be sure to uh, take a look at this as well is Cindy we're gonna talk about we're gonna go ahead and talk about something else later okay. something that you're doing pretty crazy. BC to DC now we're not gonna tell you what it is but it's BC to DC is that correct that's correct so but listen just give a shout out to them go on their page their uh, YouTube channel and do subscribe and follow them let's get them up to their 10,000 uh, views so that they can go ahead and at least start being credited for all the work that they're doing for all those heroes out there. So I want to thank you again for, for Absolutely. giving thank me you. the time thank you. To, uh, to interview you here and let, tell people your story. Yep. So, well, it's important. We can't do what we do without supporters. So that's the bottom line. You know, as a, as a nonprofit, um, we, we thrive and we survive off of donations. So Absolutely. we can't do what we do without them. So, so we appreciate it. Thank you.